I want to speak on the subject once again of a voice in the wilderness. A voice in the wilderness. Praise God. Let's begin by reading our main verses in Isaiah chapter 40. We had these up on the note on, on your screens in the New King James Version, but feel free to follow along if you have a different version. Okay. Isaiah 40, verse 3. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places smooth. Amen. Verse 5. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh, everybody say all flesh, shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now, I began last week talking about this whole biblical idea of a forerunner. And so it's important then that we understand that this anointing of a forerunner, God, God has called me to it. There's prophecies over my life. God has called certain other preachers. But also, in a real way, God has called every believer. Every believer. Everybody say every believer. To have a forerunner anointing on your life. God wants to use you to be a voice, hallelujah, in your circle of influence that Jesus Christ is coming back. So that's what we've been looking at. Today we're going to go a little bit further, amen. I'm going to speak today about how we need to find, to find our voice. There are really two things, two simple things today. This isn't a three-part message, it's a two-part message. Amen. That means you should really be able to get it today. Is that God wants to speak to us about how to find our voice. You know, so I had many years in the musical and the voice area, and you might call find your voice. You know, you have uh, people kind of uh, in, in other circles, in poetry, and maybe in things like that. Hey, you got to find your voice. you got to find out who you are. you gotta, you got to know yourself. you gotta, you got to feel comfortable in your skin and, and be able to, if you're going to speak up, you're going to make a difference in life, you need to find your own voice. As a Christian, we need to find our God-given voice. Amen? Amen? So once again, that's what we're going to look at today. And so there is and can be a misunderstanding if you just heard last week's message, which is important. That's where it, Bill, that's where it first gets set, and we need, to, we need to understand that, that God wants us to speak up in the hard places, and a lot of times people don't want to necessarily hear what we have to say. Come on. I... I don't think Herod liked what John the Baptist had to say when he called him just a, you know, he's a sleazy old snake. And so what did he do? He got so mad at John the Baptist, he arrested him, threw him into prison. And of course, he was the one that ended up cutting off his head. All because John the Baptist, he found his voice and he was speaking up and he was not reluctant to speak up to wrong things things that are wrong in the culture, wrong in the nation of Israel. Matter of fact, if you go ahead and read in Matthew's Gospel, you see here's John, he's preaching away, the multitudes now have come to him, they're being baptized, he noticed, maybe out of the corner of his eye he first noticed, here's these religious leaders, it says Pharisees and Sadducees coming. And you know, he, he did, whoa, praise we got some seats right down front, come on, even up on the platform, come on up here. No, he said, he said who told you to come? Who told you that you need to escape what's coming on the earth? Who, and he began to lambast them by the power of God, religious leaders. Now, spiritual leaders are great and awesome if they're on target. But there's nothing worse than spiritual leaders who are off. Amen? Leaders in churches are awesome. But there's nothing worse than having 
the leaders, lay leaders, deacons, things like that, that man, they're causing more damage in the community than because of their life. And what, so you know what? Uh, John the Baptist was not afraid to be bold and speak out against certain things. And so, once again, so oftentimes believers, they err more on the side of being silent when they should speak up. But so all that last, last week's message, we need to understand that. There's a boldness, a prophetic boldness that can come, that we need to, as things are getting darker and darker, as darkness comes on the people, and gross darkness on the people, as it says in Isaiah. Man, we got, we've got to be a voice, and if people around you don't know, if you've never drew the line in the sand with certain issues, they need to hear your voice. They need to hear you echoing God, speaking what God has to say. So when you talk about issues, for example, about abortion, if you speak about issues like a, a gay relationships and gay marriage, if, if you're looking at things like immorality and sexual you know, promiscuity and things like that, and vulgarity in, in culture today, and idolatry, and people just kind of doing their own, own thing. God is needing people to have that John the Baptist forerunner voice that's bold and say, Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. You need to get ready. You need to get ready. Amen. Well, you know, the Bible says, you know, the Bible says this, New Testament, is that Peter wrote this. He said, the judgment of God must begin in the house of God. And if it begins there, where are all, all the rest of the people going to be? So we, we need to take to heart things when they're hard. So, man, I, I love churches, and today is going to be more, more geared toward a, a positive vein. But you know what? To go to a church where all you hear is positive messages, feel-good messages, that is not the full counsel of God. There are times you just need to come to church and you need to hear what God has to say about things and make us feel uncomfortable. And then at the time, which I say, the most important time in the service is after the word has been preached, is right then, commitment time. What do you do with this now? Are you willing to say, I'm going to respond, Lord, in some way, some form, some fashion, I'm going to respond to you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so we need to hear tough things because our flesh wants to go ahead and go the easy route, the carnal route, the worldly route. And the Bible still says, it still says after these centuries, it says, do not love the world nor the things of the world. Now that's in 1 John, the feel good 1 John book. Do not love the world, nor the things of the world, for the love of the world, anyone who has the love of the world, does not have the love of God in them. So man, we, it needs to begin with us. But, everybody say but. but. There is more to the story of being a voice, having a voice for God. And so that's what we're going to look at in finding your voice. The two things that we need to see is number one, let me tell you what the first one is, and then we're going to read this passage. The number one thing is we need to temper our voice. Temper our voice. And if that word temper is a little off to you, I'm using it in olden terms where it would talk about how of smiths and, and uh, metal workers and all that, they would temper the metal. They would temper that sword. They would put it in the fire, cool it, fire, cool. They would have a process of different ways to temper or make stronger the metal. So when we talk about temper our voice, it means that we have to submit our voice and not be reckless with it. Amen. And if you're anybody who's spoken up about anything, you can probably, unless you're somebody you always try to forget the mistakes as soon as possible, you could probably remember times that you just, man, you just, you know, you open your mouth and it was not good. It was the truth, but it wasn't tempered. So we need to see something here in 2 Timothy. If you're there, say amen. amen. Let's begin reading in verse 1. Paul said to Timothy, he said, I charge you therefore, I charge you, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Notice how he just framed the, this, the, the picture right there. Amen. Judgment, accountability. He said this then in verse 2, preach 
the word. Be ready in season and out of season. In season, out of season could also mean when you just don't feel like it. Could mean so many different things. Then he said, convince, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and teaching. I'm going to come back to verse 2 now. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have what he calls itching ears. They will heap up for themselves teachers. In other words, they want to follow teachers that will tell them what they want to hear. Amen. I'm so thankful, so far as I know, no one in, in this church is like that. You just want to hear what God has to say. And then it goes on to say, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you, Timothy, be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, be that voice, and fulfill fulfill your ministry. Whew, wow, what a thing he just shared. Now God has called us to fulfill our ministry in our generation. Fulfill what God has called us to do. But I want you to notice verse 2 because it really has everything to say about finding your voice and tempering your voice. Notice he says this. He says to convince, rebuke, exhort. Now the NIV has it translated this way. It says, instead of convict, uh, convince, it says convict. So that's important that we see that. And then it says rebuke. And then it says encourage. Now I want to take the NIV terms here. It can be debatable, that first word, is it convincing, or is it some form of actual rebuke, because we find the, the rebuke in the second word as well. But I'm going to go ahead and take the NIV version, because the point that I want to, to stress by the Holy Spirit is this. The Holy Spirit is prompting the Apostle Paul to tell Timothy, temper your voice. In other words, don't just say anything. Now, we find that the Apostle Paul wrote to the Ephesian church, he said, don't let any corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is wholesome, and it will lift up and encourage. So we got to be careful. The Bible says, be careful what you say. So the temper is this. If you look at last week, it's important that God has called us to be a voice that cries out against the ungodly things happening in our culture and happening in the church, amen, and maybe even happening in people's lives right around us. It is a rebuke. It is a convincing and convicting of a rebuke that, man, people don't like to be rebuked. How many of you know that? And so you would be wrong if you just kind of left right now with this series and said, okay, God wants me to be a voice. I better speak up. I better go to school, to work. I got to interact with my family tomorrow. And I just better tell them like it is. I say, honey, honey, before you go too far in that, you need to temper that. You need to know that, first of all, that needs to be, because so many people are, err more on the side of not saying anything, that we need to hear that and we need to hear it again and again and again. Speak up. Come out of the closet. Amen. For Jesus Christ. Speak up. Speak the hard things. Be willing to speak the truth. I'll come back to it in just a moment, but the Bible does say speak the truth in love. So notice this, though. We need to, number one, temper our voice. Our voice needs to be counterbalanced in the moment by the Holy Spirit. Now, turn with me to Proverbs chapter 15, and I'm going to use this as an example. Now, Proverbs chapter 15 is a great chapter, one of the best chapters in Proverbs. There's other passages dealing with this subject, but it actually multiple times, and I want you to see this. I want you to see how Proverbs speaks. It's really saying, temper your voice. 
Make sure you have a godly balance to how you're speaking up for God. Verse 1, a soft answer turns away wrath. But a harsh word, see, it's contrasting here. Soft answer, harsh answer. But a harsh word stirs up anger. So here we're talking about the form in which we say something. You can say it softly or you can say it harshly. It says the tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly, but the mouth of fools pours forth, what do they pour forth? Foolishness. Their voice is not tempered. You're causing more damage in your family. You think I'm speaking up for God, I'm speaking up for Jesus Christ. You could end up doing more damage than good. Verse 4, a wholesome tongue is a tree of life. Yeah, amen? But perverseness in it breaks the spirit. Notice again a contrast happening here. Verse 7, the lips of the wise disperse knowledge, but the heart of the fool does not do so. Well, you, once again, you see a contrasting now. Now, we only have just a couple more verses to share. Verse 23, jump down. A man has joy by the answer of his mouth. It's interesting. In other words, you have joy because you don't have to put your foot in it. You don't have to regret that you stirred up, you stirred up some, some turmoil in the family or at the workplace, what have you, or in the church. And so the, a man has joy by the answer of his mouth and a word, look at this, a word spoken in due season. How good it is. A tempered voice. That's what the word of God is dealing with. Look down at verse 26. The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord, but the words of the pure are pleasant. And then one last pass, verse there, verse 28. The heart of the righteous studies how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours forth evil. What's that last verse saying? It says the person who doesn't have a tempered mouth, they can love God, love Jesus, love the Word of God, love righteousness, but if they don't temper that voice, what's going to pour out at times are things that aren't going to be good. The mouth of the wicked pours forth evil. But notice how that verse began. The heart of the righteous studies how to answer. In other words, learning how to be a better forerunner voice. Jesus is coming back. We, we don't just open our mouth and let things fly. John the Baptist didn't open his mouth. See, he was led by the Holy Spirit. That's what's so important. Let me tell you something. My biggest, I, I tend to think my biggest problem as a Christian in my earlier days, I had to learn it the hard way, and it was hard for me to learn this, is I had a problem with speaking too much. In a way, because I had this view, I was a liar before, I did all, you know, I, I was wicked in so many different ways. I accepted Jesus Christ, surrendered my life to Jesus, and I realized that when I surrendered my life to Jesus, one of the things I had to leave behind, not just a filthy mouth, but I had to uh, leave behind a lying mouth. And so I had to leave that behind. And so I had a strong conviction, church, that I cannot lie. And I wish more Christians would have that. I just cannot lie. But that strong conviction turned into a weakness in my life. Because I felt I needed to tell the truth no matter what. Now, I've been married a number of years. It's going to be, what, 38 years this next fall. And I've learned over the years. I have to learn how to, I had to learn how to keep my mouth shut. Even the simple things. How do I look in this? Well, I speak the truth. I cannot, I had such, a, such a, an over sense of truth that I, I needed to learn from the Lord discretion. <laughs> and so it comes back to Ephesians. And go ahead and turn over there. Let's just see this. This ought to be something maybe you should have marked in your Bible. I had it marked in my Bible. Huh, every Bible I had. Ephesians. 
<laughs> we see this in verse 25. Therefore, putting away lying. Oh, that's what I'm going to do, Lord. I'm going to put away lying. Let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. Yeah, that's it. I'm going to speak truth. No matter how hard, how difficult. Now, it helped with my personality. And I wasn't just a, I wasn't just personally just someone who just didn't care about people. But I had an overriding uh, impulse that I had to speak the truth and so regardless of if I, I didn't want to say that I'd say it because God is gonna hold me accountable that's what I thought but notice back in verse 15 of the same chapter but speaking the truth in love now notice growth then will occur amen I had to learn discretion. I had to learn there's time, as it says in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, there's a time to speak and there's a time to be silent. That doesn't mean you're lying. That means you need to be motivated by love. Amen. And so if you're looking at, like I did, when I thought about, oh, you know, I got to speak, I got to speak that truth, I was motivated by no matter how hard the truth is, I've got to speak it. No matter, they've got to deal with, they've got to deal with the truth, I just have to speak it. But you know, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that we need to be careful how we speak. We need to be careful how we serve it. We need to be careful so that we, we have pleasant, a pleasant way of saying even the hard things. And we need to understand, too, that sometimes the hard things should be left unsaid for the right now. And you've got to wait for the right time to say something. Amen. And that does not violate being an honest person. What it means is you're tempering your voice. And so I had to learn. I had to learn how to be gracious with my words. I had to learn to be controlled, motivated by love, not by truth. Love would say this. If I say this in the wrong way, they're not going to get the message. You out there? I have to be concerned about how people will hear things. Now, there are certain people, you have the Pharisees and the Sadducees, knuckleheads spiritually. John the Baptist just let it fly. That does not give us permission and license to say whatever we want to say. As long as I find it in the Word of God, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. And you know what? If you do that, people will start staying away from you in crowds. The very people that you want to be a blessing to and you want to be able to help, you want, see, you're not a voice if no one can hear it. Yes, Write that down. So if we turn people off by our voice, and so, you know, we did some teaching recently, and I've done teaching over the years. We've done it several times here on personalities. And I like to share uh, and describe personalities, some basic personality traits by using animals. And so just to use two animals in our personality assessment is to use the lion, being the, the person that's really aggressive and really a get-goer, and then the golden retriever that just wants to please people. And I've noticed the people who are kind of the golden retriever type personality, they're the people that err too much on the side of not speaking up. And so they need to grow a spine and a backbone. Amen. So if that's you, you need to go back and listen to last week's message several times and let it get built in you. But if you're a type of person that you're maybe more of the, the lion type personality, what you need to grow is you need to grow a heart. You need, to care. you need to care about the people that you're speaking to. Amen? Your children, your co-workers, your friends. Amen? Well, I'm just going to tell that, that, that lady at the grocery store, you know, she's so slow, I'm going to just tell her, what's the matter with you? Well, then you go back to Proverbs chapter 15, read those scripture verses again, and you realize God has called us to temper our voice. And so Paul told Timothy, correct, yeah, rebuke, but also, also encourage. So the first point, hope you got it, temper your voice. The second point of the two points here for today, the second point is this, is that God wants us to bless 
with our voice. Well, I'm going to speak the word of God, and I, oh, that prophet's anointing, and I remember seeing a, a, a cartoon issue, uh, illustration of a preacher that kind of did not have a tempered voice, and it showed the guy up there preaching away, and he's throwing out lightning bolts at the people, and there's several people in the congregation, the lightning bolts just going right through them, and they're kind of like, this. Ah. <laughs> so there is a time to say some hard things. And we're not afraid to say that, but, you know, if I get up and preach hard things every week, I mean, I won't have a church anymore. You won't have a family anymore. Your, your friends, your, your family won't want to be around you anymore. So it has to be a word in due season, and it needs to be shaped with love. So it comes to the second point, is we actually need to know how to bless people with our voice, our voice and our words. Amen. Are you with me today? Blessing people. You know, I heard something that helped shape me as a young minister. There's an old song, and I love to bring it back, just love to get it up to date. But it goes, uh, you know, I want to I spend my life mending broken people. I want to spend my life removing pain. Think about that. Instead of, I want to spend my life Telling people, giving them a what for, two cents worth or God's cents worth. I want to I want to spend my life being a person that, oh, they speak for God. No, I want to spend my life mending broken people. I want to spend my life removing pain. So when you think about a tough thing that needs to be said, some might have heard me say this before, and I've shared. I ha have, still have, a good friend that I've had since junior high. And uh, he has supported me over the years and so forth and became born again, spirit-filled and so forth, and still lives in Kansas. But uh, uh, I had a situation in high school, so I was starting to learn how to temper my voice even then. But uh, I had a situation with someone I really, I really, you know, he was a good, close friend. I found out through somebody else that he and his girlfriend were kind of, mm-hmm. <laughs> and he now is calling himself a Christian and a believer and saying he's born again. And so, uh, you know, I was one of those guys in high school. I mean, I take my Bible to, to school and so forth. And, and uh, before they, they outlawed, you can't take your Bible anymore to school. But... Uh, you know, I, so I, people got to know, they knew me before in junior high and I got in high school, man, I, I'm a different person, praise God, born again, sometimes crazy John, <laughs> but uh, I was learning and I wanted to be a voice in his life. And so I, learned, I knew this from the Bible, is to talk to somebody first, privately, so I asked to meet with him. We met in a park, and he had no idea. I didn't, I didn't show my hand uh, what I was going to talk about. But I said, I want to talk to you about something important. And then here we are, just us. And I shared with him my concern for what I'd heard. And I asked him, is it true? He admitted it's true. A lot of tears that day. And I shared with him things he already knew. He already knew. A lot of people already know certain things are sin. Now, someone in the world, that's a different picture because they're, they're, they're being raised without any sense, any absolute truths and values and so forth. But when you're talking about someone in the church, you know, you don't need to be heavy-handed with them because they're, they're probably already feeling guilty, but they're being led by the, the flesh. And so I reminded him what the Word of God said, and he just broke down, and he made a commitment. I wasn't asking him to make a commitment to me, but he was making a commitment to God and before me that he was going to not only stop, he's going to break up with his girl. Now, I, I, I didn't say he had to break up with her. I, I wasn't advising that, but he did. He knew that wasn't a good relationship. She was not a Christian. You single people, you shouldn't be dating non-Christians. Amen. Amen. What fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? Go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 
in chapter 7. But he went ahead and broke up with her. And I remember one of the toughest days I had, because I was working in a Christian bookstore at that time. And here comes his girlfriend coming in that I had known for a number of years. And she came in crying. And she's begging me to talk to him. And so they get back together. And oh my goodness, I, had, I was praying silently for the wisdom of Solomon how to deal with her. They never did get back together. And so I was learning, I was learning, and I made a lot of mistakes before and after that of saying things in a wrong way and, saying, and using my voice and speaking truth and not really, truly in the agape love of God, and it did more hurt than good. But I learned this, that I had to learn how to encourage as it says, Paul told Timothy, yes, rebuke, yes, correct. But you also need to encourage. He said this, that is preaching the word. So someone who only preaches encouraging words is not preaching the whole word. And, and someone who's just preaching the rebuking is not preaching the whole word. And it's interesting, I have learned over the years, God has given me enough wisdom to just kind of notice and see people's, that people have kind of a spiritual personality about themselves. I've had people over the years that come to church and they're, they're looking for a church that has the rebuking all the time. And that's a unique type of individual. They're the lesser group, but man, you better, you better hammer everything you can or they think you're not a godly preacher. You better hammer the government. You better ha hammer, you know, uh, Hollywood. You better, I mean, you got to do it every single week. And that's what they think is preaching the word of God. And eventually... I've had people like that that were extremes would end up leaving the church because that, that's not the type of church that uh, God has called me. That's not true preaching the word. And then there's other people that come to church have a spiritual personality where all they want to hear is make me feel good. I, I, I want to hear about the blessings of God. I want to hear about the promises of God, which are yes and amen. And, and so they're coming and they're expecting every single time the songs better lift me up in the way that I feel lifted up. The preaching needs to be in a way that's going to lift me up. And, and that, that is also an extreme. And people like that, I've had people like that, that, you know, well, you know, sometimes you get too hard, pastor. And so they end up leaving because they don't understand. And so Paul told Timothy, he said, listen, you understand this. you got to preach the word, but it needs to be a tempered voice. And in that temper, there's, there's convicting or convincing, rebuking, and encouragement. Or exhortation. I'm going to exhort. I'm going to build up. And so the second point is we need to, we need to pray. And we need to seek greater wisdom from God how we can build up with our words. How we can take even the hard thing and build up. And let me tell you this. You, it says a lot about you, if you're going to get in this message all about, okay, I'm that forerunner voice, I'm going to read, I've, I've, I've got to have that gauge where I'm seeing things that aren't right. Now, Pastor just said, I just need to learn how to be better on how to say those things. I am not saying that. I'm saying that's only part of it. And if you are just looking for all the bad, you're looking for the darkness. You're looking for that which is going to increase in these days. Perilous times will come. They'll get the wax greater and greater. The love of many will grow cold. But if that's all you see, then you're not seeing everything because God says, but the glory of God, I'm going to raise up on you. Hallelujah. So there is in the world, there's good and bad. The bad's going to continue to get worse and the good is going to get amazingly better yeah. and in contrast to one another the good is going to look amazing praise God and so what you need to do is not just see okay how can I be a voice a forerunner voice and point out all this wrong in our culture what's wrong at the workplace and things like that. you've got to be somebody that says this God has called me also to be an encourager you got to be somebody who sees things that you can encourage. You see things that you can bless with your mouth, bless with your voice. Amen? And so it's important that your intentions are good, that you respond in humility, that you respond in kindness and compassion. Speak the truth in love. Now, I tell you, and let me just end with this thought. 
There are a lot of people right around us, family members and friends, in our circle. All of us have a circle. That circle of influence will change from season to season, and that's okay. But we need to be aware who's in our circle of influence. Always being aware of those outside that we can also do this with them, but especially the people in our circle of influence. We need to see this, and maybe I'll pick up with this next week, is we need to see that, that anointing from that voice, crying in the wilderness, that forerunner voice, is someone who, as it says in Malachi, and I think that's what we'll pick up next week, is someone who turns the hearts of the fathers back to the children, the children to the fathers. You need to have compassion for the people around you. Instead of, if you are the type of person that maybe your personality, your, that needs to be, it needs to be, uh, it needs to be smoothed out, for sure. Get some godly sandpaper, smooth it out. But if your personality is, it seems like you always notice what's wrong, how someone doesn't measure up, how that child seems to keep messing up in this area, that area, how that, that person under you that maybe you're a supervisor or a boss, and it's like, man, you've got to learn to also see things that you can build up and encourage. And oftentimes, those very things that is being a voice. That is being a voice in the wilderness. There's a lot of people, and go ahead and turn back to Isaiah 40. Now, we'll end with this chapter. There's a lot of people that they've heard negative things from some precious people in their family, and it's stuck with them for years. The old saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That is one of the greatest lies in humanity. The truth is, words hurt. Words can hurt and words can build up. So it's just as true for the voice. You've got to speak out against certain things, and people need to know where you stand and draw the line. But there's so many other times, I believe the far majority of the time, are things, if you look at Isaiah chapter 40, look once again at verse 4 and 5 now. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight. Now, you could come from that from an angle that, oh, the, the, the power of God, the, the truth of God, the justice of God, He's going to straighten things out when He comes. He's going to smooth out things. He's going to cause, cause people that are in positions of leadership, He's going to bring them down. And He's going to bring... So you can look at it like this is a harsh part of judgment. It is partly. But think about this. There's so many people that they need you to tell them this. I want you to know your trouble that you're going through. Trust God. God will see you, see you through. Say it with love and a smile. You're encouraging them. You're not just rebuking them. You say, the crooked places. You're a guy, you had a lot of crooked places. I'm sorry you're going through that. But God can straighten that out. Let God straighten that out. I'll pray with you. Let God, God will straighten that out. Encourage it. What it does, it produces hope in that child or that grandchild, that friend, that co-worker. Let God straighten it out in the rough places smooth. Oh, man. It, it's connecting with them and saying, you know, I understand you're going through a rough time. I'm sorry that you're going through that rough time. But God will smooth it out. He will do it for you. He'll change it for you because of his great love. You see with that? So there's that convicting and rebuking, but there's that encouraging too. And then ending with verse 5. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed. Yes, this is prophetic. God's going to come on the scene. He's going to straighten things out. Jesus is going to straighten things out. Heads are going to roll. And then the glory of the Lord is going to be in the earth. Yes, that's part of it. But the other part is here for us now. We say, we got to tell people that's going to happen. But at the same time, in our relationship by relationship, we need to encourage people. Say, you know what? God will come on the scene. God's glory is going to be revealed. Oh, and you're going to see it. And I want you to know, and you can even have some scripture verses, you're led by the Holy Spirit. The mouth of the Lord has spoken about your situation in life. What you're doing is you're imparting hope. 
We want to raise hope. What is that that is encouragement? What is that that is also being a voice in the wilderness? Praise God. Prepare the way of the Lord. The way.